Greetings all. Well, I had a couple of people come up to me out of the blue the other day and uh, inform me that, well, it was because of this channel uh, that they got the particulars and the ins and outs that they wanted uh, when deciding what property to purchase here, you know, and about living in Hawaii and so on. Um, they told me they really liked my channel because I didn't sugarcoat stuff. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, it's, it's good. So... I think today I'm going to continue not sugarcoating life in paradise. Um, yeah, there's a f few of them around here. Every time I uh, uh, <laughs> talk about the downside, I get jumped on because they think the place is paradise. But paradise is a state of mind, not a state in the union. Yeah, so today I want to talk about the difficulties and the ease of growing certain crops in Hawaii. Uh, there is sort of an illusion out there that because this is uh, tropical, that anything and everything grows here and it grows year round and it grows easily. Okay, well, that's wrong. That's <laughs> not right. All right. Um, almost everything in the tropics is seasonal. We have seasons here, whereas Tropic of Cancer here, and uh, you know, there's some variation from winter to summer, length of day. It's not real long, but it's enough. Uh, the plants know it, and the plants respond to it, and so they have certain bloom cycles and fruiting cycles. You know, they're not all the same. Uh, you know, different citrus types have different cycles uh, very much so avocados avocados have flowering periods depending on what kind that can be almost anywhere in the calendar okay so it is possible to have avocados from your backyard almost every day of the year here uh, provided the lace bug doesn't chew your leaves off uh, if you have the right combination of varieties and uh, I got a neighbor over here with some dogs this morning that just won't shut up. And so, uh, no, they're not wild dogs. It's his kennel. I don't know what's with the dogs. So, that's fallacy number one, that everything goes on year-round on everything. Now, a few of the crops we have here, uh, which have been popular commercial crops uh, that do kind of go on er, throughout the calendar, uh, the papayas, you can get papayas almost any old time, uh, the bananas, okay, bananas will do the same sort of thing, a little slower in the winter, a little faster in the summer, uh, but still throughout the clock, throughout the calendar, they'll continue production. Now, they're unusual. Most things like the pineapple here on my place, it starts July or August and it ends about October. That's the fruiting season for that. And it doesn't really make any fruit the rest of the year. It's working on getting the next crop growing. Now, I see Gracie came running back down here. What's up, Gracie, huh? Yeah, she says, Bill, what are we doing? She says, you just going to do that camera thing today? Mm-hmm, yes, I am. Uh, so, and then a lot of the crops that we are familiar with in the United States, uh, there's a whole lot of them that are really challenging to try to raise here in Hawaii. Yeah, it's true. I honestly, I found um, most of our typical crops, yes, to be easier in. Uh, California for sure, uh, Illinois definitely, uh, Wisconsin positively. Uh, the crops were much easier to grow. Uh, California has its uh, water distribution system, and so that accommodates the fact that they have drought. Um, now the Midwest, drought's only periodic, uh, tend to have ex excellent soils. Uh, usually the growing seasons are fairly long and they're well adapted to a lot of crops. I mean, that's where all the corn and the soybeans and the wheat and the oats and the barley and all that stuff is coming from the center of the country. Uh, the cereal grains further west and north, you know, and the corn and the soybeans further south and a little east. 
Uh, but these are agricultural bread baskets, and it's much easier to grow um, the typical crops. I have a neighbor over here who's uh, moved to the area from Pennsylvania, who was just constantly moaning about the fact that oh, when we were in Pennsylvania, I used to get so much zucchini. Well, good luck trying to get any zucchini here past the pickle worm yeah almost every other state of the union you're leaving zucchini on the doorsteps right you're abandoning zucchini babies in dumpsters and things not here you know, good luck um, best solution with zucchini if you like it uh, here is to grow a parthenocarpic form and do it under floating row cover that will keep the pickle worms off we have all sorts of different pests that are just waiting to tear your crops apart and whether they're uh, you know insect things or rodents or birds uh, or diseases um, is almost near microscopic macrobes like nematodes you know we get so much, so much. You know, this is a year where I finally landed on three varieties of tomatoes this year that are really doing well. It's, it's beautiful. It's amazing because I've been at this for years trying to find the right tomato to grow in Puna. And I, I went through all the ones the university bred and not a single one of them worked over here. Uh, you know, to bear in mind that Hawaii has many, many, many different climates. It is not just a single climate here. And so the tomatoes were, you know, bred uh, for one particular growing area, uh, but they don't necessarily work over here in Puna where it rains like crazy. Yeah, uh, so bear in mind that the climate here is near arctic at the top of the peaks you know we're 13,800 and something uh feet high on mauna kea it's cold up there it snows up there a lot uh, the ground freezes up there and so on oh well, and then you come on down to the shore right and while well, the shore is uh for swimsuits you know my ties uh, under the coconut palms uh, and it's 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 warm it's comfortable it's tropical down here and then there's everything in between everything in between then there's the east side and the east side faces the trade winds that's where most of the rain comes in and falls but the west side because the mountains are so tall they get dried out. They get a rain shadow. And there are places over on the west side of the island don't even get six inches of rain. Gracie found something in my lemongrass over there. Uh, yeah, so I have had people ask me, is there a good book on gardening in Hawaii? Uh, <laughs> I've not found it. Uh, why don't you write a book on gardening in Hawaii? Well, my answer to that would be, it'd be good for this one spot. Yeah, I have soil. Most of you have lava. Okay, different. Uh, the rainfall here is high. It's really low over on the other side. So on and so forth. Everything changes so much from one place to another. A generalized tome on the subject of growing here hard to do you would have more information and better research than i do and probably be a much better writer uh too it's a difficult task uh that request sounds simple doesn't it it's not it's not not at all um, the problems even from year to year change you know we got a hurricane come through here and drop 50 inches of rain in a week that changes things <laughs> yeah yeah Sometimes we had hailstorms. I woke up to find my lettuce shot full of holes. Believe it or not, it happens. Yeah, but a whole lot of the stuff that we take for granted uh, to, to grow in gardens uh, in most of the United States, not easy to do here. The right varieties of corn grow pretty well. 
yeah i have good crops of corn without working too hard for it uh me to watch out for corn earworms but and we get corn earworms everywhere so there's nothing new about that that's a that's an old nemesis in my book the corn earworm uh, there are ways you can deal with it you know you can use bt on the silk you can use mineral oil on the silk uh, you can do what i do and that's just harvest in a timely fashion and don't allow the worms to get you know longer than this uh, get your corn off before the worms get it yeah, so, you know, corn's not bad. Uh, I have not tried too many varieties that were bred for use, uh, you know, in the continental United States. Everything I've been using here has been specifically bred for use in Hawaii. And in the case of the corn, the, the varieties work really good here in Puna. Uh, on the other hand, tomatoes, another story. I have finally landed on um, Mountain Merit skyway purple zebra uh, all three of those produce a fairly good sized tomato um, and it, so far they're incredibly disease resistant the purple zebra is much earlier i've been getting fruit off of that for a while they're a little bigger than a golf ball um i don't know how purple they are to be honest with you but uh they're striped for sure uh and they're good they have a nice flavor um uh, they produce tomatoes anything that produces tomatoes around here is good mm -hmm. yeah cherries are cherry tomatoes are easier to do here than the large fruit the uh the last three i mentioned are fairly good sized fruit um mountain merit looks like it's going to be a pretty husky fruit we'll see uh we'll see you know, I've tried growing a lot of different cabbage here. And surprisingly, uh, this is uh, counterintuitive. And that's that most of the modern hybrids and the rather fancy cabbages, the Savoys and things like that, um, that didn't produce here worth a darn. On the other hand, the plain old time open pollinated cabbages like Copenhagen Market and uh, um, Danish ballhead, they grow good. Up here, they grow real good. Now, I, I'm finding most broccoli also grows pretty well here. Uh, now, you have issues always, you know, with uh, cabbages, slugs, all right, can get on the cabbages. Um, you can pair that off. We have cabbage worms here, and so cabbage worms will eat your cabbages, the green worms. Uh, and that's the same as it is anywhere, though. I mean, you got slugs and cabbage worms just about any place I've ever been. So there's nothing new. The one thing I've seen here that is very distinct and unique to the area, and that's the uh, the red worms. I use chicken manure as a fertilizer under my cabbages, and uh, that kind of draws the red worms. They like that stuff. They crawl up inside the bottom of the head. I've heard other people tell me this too. Now they're not dangerous, you know, but I don't like the worms crawling up on the inside. I got to clean them out of there. Uh, so I guess it's because of the amount of rain or something uh, that they they like to go up there. It's drier. <sighs> but yeah, the fancy hybrids. There's zero. Now, as far as broccoli is concerned, uh, the Waltham, which is a classic open pollinated, it grows okay here. Waltham never is that great of a producer anywhere that I've ever been, though. Uh, it's an old timer. Uh, it's an original. I use Gypsy, which is a hybrid broccoli, and I also use a thing called Godzilla. Uh, both are very, very good here. Um, they'll often cut and come again, which is something not all broccoli does. Uh, I have problems with the rain on the fine curds. When the curd is really nice and tight, a lot of times it'll take in rain and it'll get a uh, brown rot. So you got to watch out for that. Uh, bring it in when it looks good. Don't leave it laying around here. That's basically it. Yeah. Um, uh, Peppers, shoo! Like some peppers that grow perennial here. Um, pretty much anything in the capsicum bacatum, bacatum and uh, quite a few in the capsicum chinensi. Uh, they just go on and on. 
Yeah, I've had habaneros here for years. Uh, they just continued on. The Hawaiian chili pepper is a chinense. It's uh, I have one bush. I think it must be five years old. You know, it's doing pretty well. They gradually get old and decline, but they hold out for a long time. Um, the Hawaiian cocktail pepper is pretty good at that. Now, ahi dulce, which is a bacatum, does that uh, very well. That uh, just goes for quite a few years. Oddball makes berry-sized peppers in the winter and nice top-shaped larger peppers in the summer. Um, but bell peppers, oh my goodness, the pe- the uh, uh, Chinese fruit flies get right in them and lay eggs all around the crown. Um, nematodes get after them. Now, there may be some varieties of the plant uh, that work better, but, well... I don't like bell peppers enough to worry about it, and I haven't searched it out. Uh, my love in peppers really is the you know, pasillas, the anchos, the mulatto poslanos, you know, and these nice Mexican peppers are my favorites, and not a one of them likes it here. <laughs> I've had to give up growing pasilla, and I don't even get a real good crop off of my uh, uh, Jimmy Nardello Italian sweets, which is another favorite of mine. Now, they don't want to crop right here either. So, you know, we get what we get. Um, Some peppers, like I say, do very well. Others, most of them, don't do well at all. Um, Beans, there's another one. Boy, I know in the Midwest they used to grow uh, everything from hard beans to green beans, uh, soybeans, edamame, uh, you know, all manner of beans. We used to win our own pintos, you know, and win our uh, uh, kidneys and stuff like that. Here, you can forget about the dry beans. It's hell to even try to manage to get a good bean seed off of a vine here because of all the rainfall. Most things either rot or sprout in the pods. Um, then most varieties for green bean, they don't grow very well here either. Uh, rust is terrible. It's a fungus here. And uh, uh, the nematode demolishes the things from the bottom up. Uh, there, I found one. It's called Poamoho from the university that'll make a pretty decent crop. It varies. Sometimes I get maybe two crops off it before it dies away. Uh, this time, the current one's out there. One, it's going to be finished. But I did get a picking. Uh, yeah, so if you get the right variety, you can manage. Yeah, I had some folks over here the other day. We were talking about crops, and I mentioned uh, how you can't grow potatoes. They said, oh, we grow potatoes. I go, how? <laughs> well, it turns out they just chose them some spuds off the store, uh, you know, off the produce counter. Uh, now, there are GMO potatoes in circulation. Uh, I don't know whether that's what they ended up with, because in the U.S., the only breeding for potato blight I can find anywhere is with GMO varieties. Uh, England and Australia, well, they have some that are in standard breeding that have the blight resistance. If I had those spuds here, I might be able to grow them. But boy, they get the potato blight so fast. Well, these folks, I guess, were covering them during the rains. They were growing it in the kiddie pool full of custom-made soil. And they managed. I saw photographs of their spuds. Uh, I, I decided to give it a try. And so I put some reds and I put some uh, some yellows in out there. And we'll see. It will be the fifth or sixth time I've planted spuds. And uh, <laughs> all previous attempts have been disastrous. But I saw them. They'll like honest people. I'm sure they were telling me the truth. And so I'm going to see what I can do here with that one. But it it ain't easy, man. Even the sweet potatoes, which seem to grow very well here, um, well, there's all kinds of bugaboos on them. Uh, there's, a, there's a sweet potato borer that started to disfigure them, gets inside the potatoes. Um, and I had the tortoise beetle golden tortoise beetle literally massacre the vines one year up top eat the leaves Uh, i had so many beetles that i was considering spraying the patch before i harvested instead i went through with the flamethrower i got my road tar flamer and i flamed all the vines beetles and all 
uh, roasted the whole works before I dug the potatoes. Now, the following year, they disappeared. I don't know, maybe my eradication was so thorough. I, I doubt it. Uh, it's, you know, same thing with this lace bug on the avocados. Boy, I went to town last year, just trash stuff. Now, doesn't seem to be here anymore. That kind of stuff happens, too. You know, I, California, uh, we had pretty good citrus. Uh, down south, they have uh, citrus decline, Tristesia. Um, but we didn't have it in the northern part of the state. Citrus was fairly easy. You get some scale, a few aphids maybe, but it was a pretty easy crop. Here, the trees grow pretty well. I don't have the scale problems as bad. I do have aphid. Uh, probably as bad or worse on the citrus, but what I do have here is citrus canker. I never even saw it before. It makes corky patches all over fruit, all over the leaves, distorts things. It seems to vary depending on what time of year, or what year it is, you know, conditions. Uh, it also varies from variety to variety. My observation is that tangelos are the most susceptible. Limes and lemons are the least. Sweet orange is not bad. Tangerine's pretty good uh, to resist it. I happen to like tangelos, though, and I have at least four different types out there in the field, and they all seem to suffer from the stuff. You can spray for it. You know, you can use copper. Use fungicides on it that'll probably work. Uh, I don't like spraying. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, even lettuce. I originally I said, "Oh yeah, man, puna, all that rain, lettuce, absolutely." Well, then the rat lungworm got here. Oh boy, so we got a problem with lettuce. Well, I had another problem with lettuce too, and I don't know why. I haven't figured it out, but. On a lot of varieties here in Pune, central stems seem to elongate on varieties that don't usually do that. They're not bolting because it doesn't push up to seed. It just ends up where the heads I'd see in California or in Wisconsin were tight with a short stalk. Same variety here like salad bowl produces a rather long stalk. Elongated stalks are a problem on lettuce. Um, I do okay with uh, Coastal Gem Romaine. The Manoa lettuce, which is a local variety, does okay. Uh, it gets pummeled when the rain is too hard because it's so soft. Um, one of the two best I've run across so far, Bauer and Panacea. Bauer is one of the best. And it's a compact type of, of an oak leaf or salad bowl. You know, the more compact the varieties are, it seems, the less they elongate here. A lot of it has to do with figuring out what variety is going to work. If you plant one type of lettuce, you plant one type of bean, and uh, it poops out on you, which it very well may. Uh, if you figure, well, that's the end of the story, well, you're out of luck. The only people who are going to get uh, to actually get that crop of beans or get that good crop of lettuce are the ones that are willing to continue over and over again trying this one and trying that one. I have a long history of seed trial. Uh, when I lived in northern Wisconsin, we had 90 to 120 days growing season. It took a lot of trials. Uh, to be able to find what tomato, what melon, you know. Uh, and so I just kind of got used to that uh, trialing stuff. It's a bit frustrating here because I find over 80% of what I trial <clears throat> doesn't work out. You know, onions, same thing. Um, even sh just short day onion. Short day onion is what you have to have if you want onions here. <clears throat> but uh, even still, the rain event, um, it, it gets under the skin of some of the yellow onions, uh, uh, Magdalena, uh, Pumba seems to resist it pretty well. Uh, there's a white one called White Castle that seems to resist the rain pretty good. Um, but uh, red onions, red rocket, uh, the rain caused some sort of damage, caused the onions to split. They look more like shallots. Um, 
a lot of them they just take on water in the skin and will begin to decompose right in the row on you uh, you gotta be careful in harvesting them and how you cure them and store them and everything uh, it's not easy i do it but it's not easy uh, leeks and scallions are a much better choice here as well as chives dolores the chive excellent koba the japanese multiplier scallion from the university wow what a wonder it goes on and on and on and on and on produces nice sweet uh, green onions uh, yeah these are these are very reliable in this area they don't have a lot of problems uh, the right chive the right scallion uh, leeks even classic king richard uh, leek varieties it doesn't seem to matter that much um, as far as what type i planted they all seem to be doing pretty well uh, so leek is also good now garlic and literally impossible yeah, green garlic but we don't have the proper fertilization or the proper photo periods to trigger garlic to go through a, uh, a greening and then a bulbing cycle here it goes through a greening cycle and then it don't know what to do and it gets the time to do a bulb it sits there and goes well uh and rots in the ground uh, i had a uh, viewer who has uh, relatives in thailand um, who actually acquired some uh, uh, thai garlics from me and uh, well i was hopeful but that was months ago i put the things in the ground and nothing's come up i don't know why i haven't dug in after him to see if they're down there or not but if you're listening you might tell me what happened with yours when you tried it i'm curious uh with that thai garlic so you know it's all about finding variety and that's a lot of work so people who think that anything and everything grows around here are wrong um there are things that grow like weeds you know i taro has its issues too but taro is a traditional crop here taro grows fine uh there's a bunch of things like the hibiscus for instance it grows fine here although the fruiting hibiscus the rosel the one that we like to drink and tea and so on well that one does okay but um terrible problems trying to get the seed to ripen properly and be viable because of the rain uh horrible problems with the birds shredding the the seed out of the calyx and then if you don't get it at just the right stage the rosell will then get mildew all over the pods uh in fall so you can do it i do it it takes care you know it's not easy uh if you're uh, looking for a crop that you can kind of get lazy with is ant rosell man uh, anyhow that's just a short all right it's a short there's so much to know on this subject and i'm still in the midst of trying to work things out still trying to find the right variety of spinach still trying to find a second variety of green bean that will actually grow here uh and so on yeah it's 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 not easy if you think you will move here to hawaii and you're going to be food self-sufficient well if you can stand eating some of that permaculture stuff that these guys eat you know well maybe you'll get by some of those plants that they use here in permaculture are um, um, easy to grow some of them katuk uh, for instance grows fine here um my problem is <laughs> ain't food <laughs> sorry i'm a little pickier than that about my diet you know if i was starving i'll eat anything practically anything but i'm not starving and i'm generally capable enough at producing the standard type of produce that most of us enjoy and like uh, i'm pretty good at it and so i wouldn't really consider moving away from that and moving into some of these permaculture type plants that i don't know man you know it's like uh, uh one of the the uh tree spinach they eat that's a euphorbia well euphorbia latex is poison well you can eat the stuff if you boil it 
and change the water and boil it again to boil <laughs> off the toxins. <laughs> this is not food. I'm sorry. This is for starvation, you know, but it's not food. Yeah. Well, anyway, that'll give you some basic idea. I ain't sugarcoating it today at all. It can be really hard to grow your own food here in Hawaii. It can be. Depends on what you want to eat and how you go about doing it. How dedicated you are to this idea because it's not just going to happen. If you're in Minnesota right now and you're planting your garden, trust me, you're going to be able to grow a wider variety of crops with less trouble where you're at than I will here in Hawaii. The only advantage I get is my scenery is great because I'm overlooking the ocean and the weather's pretty good around here if you don't mind rain. Hang loose, folks. Aloha.